Um, hi everyone, my name's Hannah and today I'm going to be talking to you about my PhD uh, which is exploring intentional bias and the overall recovery experience of individuals with a drug and alcohol dependency. And this, these projects are in collaboration with KAIS, which is a drug and alcohol charity based in North Wales. So I've got three studies, uh, the first two are complete and the third one I'm currently analysing, but if I have time I'm hopefully going to go through all of them so I can give you a good idea of what I'm doing. So my first study, uh, Attentional Bias as a Predictor of Treatment Outcome. So first a bit of background. So despite the um, obvious issues that, the, that alcohol dependency causes for individuals, there's also an impact on the wider society. So it's estimated that alcohol problems cost the NHS approximately 3.5 billion a year. And despite constant improvements to these services, including the improvements of detoxification units, Relapse rates are still as high as 70%. So researchers are really interested in looking at so why these relapse rates are so high. And one of the factors that's been considered is attentional bias. And attentional bias is seen as a key component of addiction that helps encourage cravings and maintain the addiction. As a note, um, attentional bias is an automatic shift of attention towards personally meaningful stimuli, which, is, which isn't under conscious control. So, for example, in terms of someone with an alcohol dependency, when they go to a supermarket, they might be automatically directed their attention towards the beer aisle or some wine at the counter. And the most commonly used measure of attentional bias is the alcohol street test. And what happens here is alcohol or neutral words appear on the screen, and what they have to do is try and ignore the meaning of the word and respond to the colour of the word. So blue, but they might still be thinking about the beer. And the idea is that individuals who have an alcohol dependency are slower to respond to alcohol-related words because it grabs their attention and directs them away from the task. And stroop interference is then calculated by taking away their neutral reaction time scores from their alcohol reaction time scores. So each person acts as their own control. So there's been lots of research uh, done into alcohol potential bias, and it's been found that an individual's level of dependency is often proportional to their level of attentional bias. And there's also been some more clinical implications. So a study by uh, Cox, Hope and Christian and Race found that when they measured attentional bias in a detoxification unit, this was predictive of a treatment outcome. So individuals who relapsed had a greater alcohol attentional bias than those who were successful. And this has also been replicated in a naturalistic setting. However, further research is still needed. This, this is only two studies. And if we want to consider using this as a predictive tool, we need to do more research in the area. So that was one of the aims of this first study, to validate the use of the alcohol street as a predictive tool. Also, in line with the current recovery movement in addiction, we didn't want to just focus on uh, the negatives. We also wanted to focus on predictors of treatment success. And it's been suggested that recovery is an unconscious shift in your cognitions, your emotions and your behaviours. Because if you ask somebody in detox, are they ready to change, they're more than likely going to tell you yes. Even if they, even if they don't, they might really want to. So we, see, we want to see if we could detect this unconscious shift using a recovery-based troop task. And we predicted that like clients who um, relapse are slower to respond to alcohol-related words, we, we predicted that individuals who are successful will be slower to respond to recovery-related words as they are meaning, more meaningful to them. And this might be a more robust and stable predictor of treatment outcome, because alcohol attentional bias has been criticised to be influenced by cravings and motivational states. So what we did is we had a control group of staff members and a, uh, and a 45 clients who took part in this study, and what they were asked to do is to rate four lists of words. Um, so positive and negative change words, which were associated with recovery, alcohol-related words, and neutral words. They were supposed to rate these lists of words for how meaningful they were to them, and then pick the eight most important. And this is because we wanted the street task to be individualised to their experiences. So what would happen is in the detox unit, they would uh, rate the words, perform the individualised street task, and fill in a number of questionnaires. And so would the, um, so would the staff members. And then three months later, uh, we would then meet the clients again, give them the questionnaires again, and determine their treatment outcomes, so whether they drank after treatment three months later. So from the individuals included in the analysis for the clients, um, we had 50 individuals who had returned to dependent levels, and 20 individuals that were abstinent on non-dependent drinking. 
And this is because no abstinence isn't everybody's goal. So these individuals may have one or two drinks. Um, and what we found, which was really interesting, was that there was no significant differences on questionnaire results between these two groups. So explicit measures couldn't predict their treatment outcome, including the readiness to change questionnaire, which is supposed to determine how ready somebody is to go into recovery. So just as a reminder for the street results, uh, street results are cal experience scores calculated by taking away each person's neutral reaction times from the alcohol, negative change or positive change scores. And what we found is that individuals who relapsed had a greater alcohol intentional bias and interestingly, a greater positive change intentional bias than those who were successful, which wasn't particularly what they expected. And the negative change scores were not significantly different from each other, so we didn't include these in any further analysis. I then ran a logistic regression model, um, including the alcohol change and positive change words, and this overall model was significant. But the significant pre predictor of this model was the positive change scores. So what does this mean? This is suggesting that the positive change scores may be a better predictor of treatment outcome. And this finding was supported by significant relationships between positive change attention or bias and the number of continuous drinking outcomes such as the amount of units that they drank afterwards, uh, the amount of drinking days, the heavy drinking days that they drank afterwards. All of these are significant. And we have a few explanations as to why we found all three results, but I'm just going to focus on the positive change one today. Um, it could be that recovery is a current concern to all individuals. So the idea is that you have an intentional bias towards things that are a current concern to you. And it's likely that people who relapse still want to be in recovery, so it's still a goal or concern of theirs. So all, so all of the individuals would have been initially orientated to the word. However, the individuals who relapse probably find these words quite threatening and, and evasive because it's something they want and they can't quite have. So that would mean, and when we, we find words threatening, we tend to find it hard to disengage from them. Whereas there's been research that suggests that if you see a positive word that produces a positive effect, it can broaden your attention and facilitate your, uh, facilitate your task ability. So what could have happened here for the, positive, for the successful individuals is that seeing the word actually facilitated them and made them easily disengage from it and continue with the task. However, future research is needed to, to validate whether this is the case and also before we use it as a predictive tool. It's also worth noting that staff weren't a very good control group and it was found that their intentional bias scores sat in between the relapsed and successful individuals and weren't significantly different from either. And this could be because staff, um, staff are working in this environment full time um, and it's likely that alcohol recovery related words are still very important to them because it's part of their full time job. So this is suggesting that in future research we perhaps shouldn't use staff as a control group. So overall, explicit measures cannot predict treatment outcome as the shift towards recovery is an unconscious process and a recovery based treat using positive words might be a better predictor but further research is needed to validate this as a tool. Okay, so study two. So uh, study two is exploring personal experiences of social-based recovery groups. And the reason this, stu this study came about was because of when I met people three months later um, to determine their treatment outcome, when they were filling in the questionnaires, they would often informally tell me stories about what, um, recovery experiences and all the diverse things that happened to them and the recovery experiences that they had. And I found myself getting a bit frustrated because the diverse experiences that they had weren't really captured by the questionnaires. So I wanted to focus the rest of my PhD on capturing these personal experiences, but doing so in a scientific manner, and ensuring that we really listen to the experts of addiction, who is the in which are the individuals themselves. So the diversity of recovery is, is emphasised by the lack of clear definition within the literature. So a lot of the definitions often focus on abstinence, However, there's been some researchers that have acknowledged that recovery is more than abstinence. It's also about improving your well-being and reducing um, alcohol-related problems. And one thing that's often a key component of individuals' recoveries is their involvement in recovery groups. And these recovery groups are peer-led groups involving members who are all in recovery, helping one another to, along the recovery journey. And recovery is a process, not an endpoint. So it doesn't finish once you leave treatment. And these recovery groups provide you provide you something beyond treatment. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of different recovery groups, um, but the most, most well-known one are 12-step groups such as Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, and Narcotics Anonymous. And there's been a lot of research exploring the effectiveness and involvement in these groups. However, there are 
there are emerging groups within the UK that have not been studied within the literature, such as ABRO. So ABRO is a group in North Wales, and this is a social-based recovery group. Uh, what social-based recovery groups are is they're complete, entirely based around social activities, and they recognise as many pathways to addiction, unlike 12-step groups, and as a result are inclusive of everybody who wishes to attend. And while across the UK there's been a, a large uptake of these groups, there's been no literature whatsoever exploring why people go along to these and why they're important. So I wanted to do that. As there's no research and as there's no previous research, I wanted to explore this qualitatively. I wanted to explore people's experiences within these groups to get an in-depth understanding of how they impact their recovery and also try and understand what makes them different from other mutual aid groups, such as the 12 step groups. So for this study, we had um, 10 individuals involved in three different groups across North Wales, and it was proposed for sampling. And this sample size and sample and sampling technique are both very commonly used in qualitative fair research. And um, we did semi-structured interviews, which lasted about an hour, and I asked some questions such as, what does it mean to you to be part of this recovery group? So to ensure that um, our research was done scientifically, uh, we, we used Smith and Osborne's step-by-step -step approach. And this approach is used for interpretive phenomenological analysis, which is the qualitative analysis technique I used. And what this analysis technique tries to do is tries to make sense of individuals' personal and social work, world, and tries to make sense of people's experiences through interpreting. So the steps, I'm not going to go through them in detail, but basically what it involves is a lot of work. Um, familiarising yourself with the data, transcribing, coding each and every transcript individually, creating themes from the codes, comparing the themes, comparing them back to the individual transcripts, and then inevitably coming up with an overall theme table which has all the themes you've found across all the ten transcripts, and then identifying whether they're seen in all the different transcripts. So from this process, I came up with four key themes. I'm going to go through each of these, and on the screen there's going to be examples of quotes of what individuals said that relate to these themes. I could provide you hundreds of quotes, but I've tried to pick some of the best ones for each of them. Okay, so the group's role in recovery. So what was really interesting was that the group's role in recovery depended on where the individual was in their recovery. So for individuals who were early in their recovery, they saw the group as a main source of support for them and vital for what they were doing. And this is seen in the first quote. However, for those that were later on in their recovery, they no longer saw the group as particularly important to them. They still went along, but it wasn't, it wasn't vital for their recovery. But what they all acknowledged was that this group provided them alternative activities to substance misuse, such as the social activities, which they were all really grateful about. And this first theme has kind of emphasised the diversity of recovery experiences, and this brings me on to my second theme, personal choice and flexibility in the recovery experience. So what was really noted was that flexibility both within the group and within the recovery network was really important for these individuals that we interviewed. So within the group, um, all the participants identified how it was important that they could speak about whatever they wanted to talk about within the group. There was no restraints. And also they could come and go when they pleased. And then for the wider recovery network, half of the individuals were also involved in 12-step groups as well. And whilst the other half weren't involved in 12-step groups, they identified why they didn't go, but also acknowledged the fact that they realised that everybody's, everybody's recovery experience was different and there was no right way to recover it. So a lot of the um, interviews and the information I received was extremely positive about these groups and how these groups had impacted on their lives. And all of the individuals mentioned how warm and inclusive and welcoming these groups were to them and how one of the most important components of this group was that it was full of like-minded individuals who'd gone through the similar experiences to them, which is something that you don't get from a treatment mm -hmm. provider. And a lot from this, a lot of strong bonds and friendships have developed, and a few individuals identified that this group was just like their family. And finally, active involvement in the recovery group. So all individuals were actively involved in the recovery group, whether this was in terms of organisation, taking part in activities, or being on the board. And this also meant that individuals were a great source of support to others. So they felt the need to give back to others for the support that they received. However, there was also a negative to this with the active involvement, is that they also tended to be involved within the group's struggles. And a few of them pointed out that the group's struggle for funding was something that they were all involved with. So what does this all mean? Theoretically, this has helped provide us an understanding of previously unresearched groups. Um, and also, it's provided us, if we compare this to the previous literature, we can see some similarities. 
So moot in 2007 identified 12 ingredients of a successful recovery group. And some of these are apparent in our interviews. So factors such as bonding and support, uh, giving back to others, um, and providing alternative activities. However, other components that Moose identified, such as um, having a goal to focus on and expectations of consequences, I didn't find in this study. However, that could just be because these individuals don't find those factors important, or maybe they're not offered by the group. And that's something that my third study is looking at. And practically, this has highlighted the importance of these groups and why they need to receive funding to carry on, because not everybody wants to go to a 12-step group. And some individuals go to a 12-step group don't enjoy it and, and end up relapsing because they don't want to go along to that group and they think there's nothing else out there. So we need to focus on, it, on letting people know about these groups and encouraging um, commissioners to fund these groups as they're so important. And finally, study three is exploring the components of addiction recovery groups. So um, what, what I wanted to do here is look at recovery groups in general. So what makes groups so successful? And what, makes, what are the important components of these? So like I mentioned before, uh, Moves identified 12 active components, and this was based on four key theories, um, and they're on the screen. However, there's a few criticisms to Moves' paper. Uh, firstly, this is a literature review, so it's based on the literature, and nobody's actually just asked individuals, simply ask them, what is important to you and what are you getting from your group? And if we truly believe that the individuals in addiction are the experts, then surely we should be asking them about this. Also, these 12 components were based from 12-step uh, groups, so we don't know if these, 12, if these components would be apparent in other groups as well. And they're also based on USA studies, so it's, we need to see whether it would be the same within the UK. So that was our aim. Capture the diversity of mutual aid groups and determine whether 12, the 12 components will be identified in national and locally based groups within the UK. So how did we do this? So to do this, we used Sensormaker, which is an exploratory tool we use to try and understand complex systems and it's never been used in the addiction field before. And what it basically asks individuals to do is to share a story about their recovery group experience and then add meaning to their story by answering a set number of questions. So as an example, if they go on, if they go on then, uh, this is an online survey, but what we found is that most individuals in this population didn't necessarily have access to computers, so most of this has been done in paper copies, but I'll show you the online version. So they, ask a, they answer a question such as, if a friend was thinking of joining your recovery group, what story would you share about it? Then they'll share a story. Then we're asking to quantify their answer on a, number of, on a number of factors. So on these triads, there's the 12 components, and they're asked to drag the bubble in the middle to which component they think is most important. Following this, they then get asked for each of the 12 components, how important is it to you, and how much is it offered by your group? And they'll drag it along the scale. They then also have to answer a number of demographic questions and also some well-established recovery-based questionnaires. And so far in this project, we've had 150 individuals take part, and we're going to start analysing uh, next month. And from these individuals are from a diverse range of groups from all across the UK. So we've got a really good sample to work with. And not only will we get qualitative data from the stories of this, we'll also get quantitative data from the ratings on the questionnaires that they've filled in. Okay, so that's all. Uh, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. I hope my projects have kind of, I hope hopefully my projects have showed you the importance of including individuals within addiction um, within research, and hopefully we'll have found some findings that are not just important theoretically, but also practically that can be used for recovery groups and with kites. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions?